and I am Dan Harris. If you have any questions, um, you, you know, you think of later down the road, Dan at BoogerHillB.com. YouTube is BoogerHillB. Um, I keep anywhere from probably around 100. I probably have about 150 hives right now. I've had as many as probably 250. I keep complaining and insisting that I'm going to start to cut back. But you know, I look at the things I'm doing and none of them are directed toward cutting back, you know? I, and so I, I, you know, what I say and what I do are not the same thing, uh, oftentimes. The other thing I, I will tell you before I get started, <clears throat> please, 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 never take anything I say as though I'm telling you that's the way you should do it. Never, ever, ever, ever take it that way. Um, I'll talk about the way I do things and, and the way I've found that works for me. You may have better ways. I'm open to hearing about them as well. Um, don't abandon something that works for you or that you're comfortable with just to try my way because you know it, it may not work at all for you. And, and so I'm, I'm just going to talk about the way I do this and why I do it the way I do it. The other thing I'll do sometimes, not this trip, but you know sometimes when I'm doing a talk, I'll I'll repeat things that beekeepers that I know and have confidence in have told me. But generally speaking, um, I try to keep it to my own experiences, and, and for better or worse, that's what I'll try to do tonight. Also, I, I started out this with, um, with a making that the topic was initially going to be late season splits, but I'm going to talk about splits in general. And I'm going to talk about early season splits and late season splits and the differences in the two, at least by my approach, because they're not that much different. And so I can talk about both of them together and I can show you the difference in the way I do each and why I do it and it may make a little more sense. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each. This is the aftermath of a splitting marathon in one of my yards this spring. This, that's, you know, and, and um, sometimes they look even worse, but that's, you know, looks like a tornado went through and there's some cleanup to be done, but you'll see there's plenty of nukes. And this was my springtime. You can tell it was springtime because the apple tree's in bloom. So the, the distinction I make between a late season split and an early season split, an early season split around here to me is from somewhere in March through the month of April. And it, I define that pretty much by saying that the split you make, or I make, that I would call an early season split, I want a nectar flow to be part, I, I want a nectar flow ahead or, or beyond the time when I do that split. Because I'm going to depend on that nectar flow to have those bees build out their nest and draw comb, and I'm going to feed them. But the feeding is a supplement to the nectar that's coming in. So my early season splits typically around here, March and April, I would consider uh, a, an early season split. Late season Ju June or later, um, this spring, I actually did some end of, of May splits that I called a late season split. Maybe not by my, by my definition, but generally speaking, there's not going to be much or any more nectar flow after I do them. And as luck would have it, when I did, when I ordered queens for my late season splits this year, you guys remember that, like that 10 day period in May when it hit about 100 degrees every day? Well, that's when my queens came, you know? And it was like, oh, you know? And, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about, when I did those splits, I really had great anxiety because of that heat. And, and I'll explain in a little bit why I had the anxiety and why it worked out for me in spite of that anxiety. Okay, what are the reasons? I mean, we're, we're you know, why are we going to split? In the spring, our early season splits, to me, my predominant reason for doing them is for swarm management. And if I'm doing a split for swarm management, the most important thing is to get a young queen in that established hive. Young queens are, a hive with very young queens, the younger the better, are dramatically less likely to swarm than ones that have older queens, even six months or eight months old. If you can put a new queen in there, 
and you do all of the other swarm management things you might ordinarily do, the prospect of that hive not swarming and producing that much more honey is dramatically improved. So my first reason for doing early season splits is for swarm management. Um, at the same time, you're taking some frames away. So it with bees and brood and the old queen. And so you are reducing the congestion in that nest. The other reason, of course, is if you want to increase your hive numbers, you do, you can use, you know, your early season splits. And then the third thing would be if you want to sell nukes. Late season. Okay. You ever try to buy queens first of April? I mean, you know, unless you've got a connection somewhere, you're probably going to have trouble finding them. Most of the major suppliers, early spring, their queens are spoken for. They have um, large package producers, nuke producers that are buying and they have standing orders every year. And so the queen producers are tied up. So a lot of times for your early season splits, you're going to have a dickens of a time getting a queen. Later season, first thing is you can get queens. Anytime after about the middle of May, you know, the door opens and you can get queens from practically anywhere. The other purpose behind doing a later season split is if you want to increase your numbers. And the third is if you want to sell nukes the following spring, overwintered nukes, a late season nuke, or a late season split that you overwinter, it will build up. I mean, they'll build up, they'll be building up in March. And if you look after them in the spring properly, if you feed them and supplement them, if let's say, for example, like me, you're running two deep boxes for your brood typically, you can, by the middle of April, have both of those boxes drawn out and you can put a super on and make a surplus. So a late season split, that, you know, this time of year, your bees are consumers. They're not doing anything for you at all. So now if you divide them, they'll be worth something more to you in the spring. That's the long and short of it. The other thing is if you sell nukes in the spring, you can, you can ask a premium for an overwintered early season nuke. I charge generally $150 for a regular spring started nuke. I charge $180 for an overwintered nuke. So those are the reasons that you would do those two different kinds of splits, an early season or late season, at least by my, the way I would do it. So how do I do an early season split? Okay. I take, and I'm going to have some pictures here following all of this, but I, I had a lot of information I wanted to try to filter out first. I take um, in the spring a frame of cat brood, a frame of open brood, and a frame of pollen, and a couple frames of foundation, and that's what I put in the nuke. Now there's madness in my reason. First off, I, want, I don't want to take any more from the established hive than I need to at that point. I want to keep that population relatively high I take the old queen, the queen that is the, the, in that production hive, and she goes with the split. The second thing I do, and I guess I can explain why I don't give them any honey. I can feed them honey. I can feed them sugar water. What I'm going to try to do is, well, all right, let me just follow my, follow my list. Then. In addition to taking the bees that were on those frames, I shake a truckload of bees into those boxes as well. I mean, I, and I'll show you pictures. I, you know, I'll have bees boiling out of the front. I'll shake many, many, many more bees into that split than, than I need. Because I'm going to move that nuke, and I'm going to leave it in the same yard as, it, as, its, as its donor hive. And it's just going to be, you know, 40 feet away from where it originated. And a lot of the old foragers are going to go back to the original nest. The reason I put, make sure that there's a frame of open brood is open brood is a magnet for nurse bees. And so when I'm shaking those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of extra bees, some of those guys are going to be nurse bees. 
And a lot of those are going to stay. Foragers are going to go back. So a week later, after I've shaken these things, loaded them full of bees, if I go back and look, I'll see that they still have good population, but it's not that massive population it was when I made the split. I feed them sugar water. And the reason, of course, there's a couple of reasons. First off, early in the spring, I want them to draw comb and, and they can bring in nectar, but sugar water is a supplement for comb drawing. The other thing is, is I have a boatload of nurse bees in there, and I want as many of those nurse bees to remain nurse bees as I can for as long as I can until I start to have that, that cat brood emerging and the population starts to build up. And if I don't feed them, if they have to go and forage, those, a lot of those nurse bees will stop being nurse bees and become foragers. So I don't want them to shift their job. I want them to stay as nurse bees as long as I can. So they got a frame of pollen, I'm feeding them sugar water, and most of them will remain as nurse bees until the population of the hive starts to build up and then those older nurse bees will become foragers. Does that make sense? Okay. Then, I have to go back to the original donor hive a week later, seven days, and cut out every emergency cell because there are gonna be emergency cells in it. And the reason I use seven days is from the time an egg is laid until about six days later, that, that can be turned into a queen. After six days, they're done. So if I give them seven days, I go in and I cut every emergency cell out, they're hopelessly queenless. They can't make a queen now. And then they're gonna take whatever I give them. If I introduce, if I do my splits, the way I'm doing them with, with open brood and a frame of cat brood, if I immediately put a new queen in the old hive, well, I'm confusing two things I'm doing, I'm sorry. If I go right back into that donor hive, the minute I make that split, take the old queen away, if I put a queen in a cage in that donor hive, they'll kill her 75% of the time. They will, they will make a replacement queen, an emergency queen, far in preference to anything I can put in there. So if I wait the seven days, I go in and cut out all the emergency cells and I give them a new queen then, then they're hopelessly queenless and they'll accept her 90 plus percent of the time. Does that make sense? You guys are all looking didn't, real. Didn't you put the old queen in that donor hive? I put the old queen in the split. So I, from the donor hive, which is a production hive, I took, I took three frames. I took a frame of cat brood. I want, I want, I want a population of about 5,000 bees coming out of that cat brood really quick. I gave them a frame of open brood because that's a magnet to keep those nurse bees intact. I give them pollen because I don't want them to have to forage for pollen. And I give them a boatload of nurse bees and I leave the old hive queenless. And then seven days later, I go back into the original hive, the, the donor hive, and I cut out all those emergency cells. And you can't miss one. If you miss one, you're done. So you cut them all out, you put in a new queen, and away they go. You're saving nine days, right? From It's about it. Is, nine or is ten. Is there a reason why yep. you want those sure. nine days? <laughs> well, you mean between letting them make them? Okay. Several reasons. Um, I can tell you're a fan of walkway splits, aren't you? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not a fan of walkway splits. Um, in my yard, where I do most of my splits, uh, I would tell you that walkway splits probably are successful 70% of the time. And I don't want to take a 30% beating. I just don't want to do it. That's one reason. Um, if, if, you make, if you have an artificial environment where... Um, you, you, you have sustenance for parasites. The next thing you know, you're gonna have an abundance of parasites. Well, 
my yard I have an abundance of bee parasites. I have Phoebes. Out, they're just, they're everywhere. Didn't used to be. I used to be able to get a 90% a, a return on queens successfully mating in the whole nine yards. No more. I'm well under 80%, you know, from from if I try to you know, do, use queen cells or use swarm cells or whatever, I'm under 80% because I've got Phoebes, I've got, I don't know, I've got dragonflies, I've got tons of predators that pre predate on the bees. And so that's one of the reasons. The other reason I'm not a, fond, I'm not a fan of walkaway splits is inbreeding. If you do walkaway splits over and over and over again, you know, it, it, eventually you're going to have a problem with inbreeding. And the third reason is I, I, like, I like a good genetic mix, and I like what a lot of the queen producers, the really good ones, and there's some really good ones out there, I like what they're doing. I like their selection process. I can't do it. You know, I, I worked at the Bee Lab for a couple of years. We had a, a queen selecting queen breeding program, and I saw what went into that, if it's done right. And if I was going to do that, that's all I could do. That's what I'd do. That'd be, that'd be the focus of my business. So that's the third reason. I, I really think that if you, choose, if you choose your queen producer carefully, they earn every penny you give them. They earn every penny that you give them. But I, I won't try to talk you out of walkway splits. I think there's a place for those as well. I just wouldn't want them. You can't do it all the time. You need to you need to mix it up a little bit. Okay, late season splits. I don't care where the queen ends up with late season split. Okay, I want it to come out of the old hive when I make an early season split. When I'm making late season splits, she can stay with the old hive, or she can go with the split. I don't care. But she, you know, one or the other. Um, late season splits. I want to use drawn comb. I'm not giving them any foundation. This time of year, they're not going to draw any. They're not going to draw any comb for me. I, I hear people say they can feed them into drawing comb. If I feed mine now, and they have foundation, they're just going to backfill a brood nest. They they won't make comb. I don't know what it is, and it's probably just my bees. Maybe says mixed up genetics. I don't know, but whatever it is, um, after the end of a natural nectar flow, I'm done drawing comb. So all I'm trying to do with my late season splits is divide my hive so in the spring I have coming out of winter twice as many hives, potentially some that I can sell for a premium, and they come out early enough. If I choose to keep them, I can let them build up and potentially make a, a surplus. <clears throat> so I'm going to use drawn comb. I give them capped honey. I give them capped brood, open brood, pollen honey, give it all to them. I'll feed them as well. Once again, I shake in a load of bees, same reason. Shake in plenty of bees, always shake in plenty of bees. One of my phrases that I use pretty often is, just say no to dinks. You know what a dink is? A dink is a you know, weak hive, a hive that's just kind of limping along. A dink, just, just I, I have no tolerance for dinks. I, they take too much time, they take too much energy. If you try to nurture one, you know, six months later, all you got is a six month older dink. It just, it, they're just not worth it. And it's the same thing if you're making a split and you make an under, underwhelmed split. If you don't have a big enough population, that thing's gonna be a dink and it can hardly ever recover. It, it's, it's a tremendous challenge for a handful of bees to turn around the hive from scratch. So don't, don't cheat your splits. Don't cheat them on bees. Don't, don't think you're getting away with something because you can take you know, a couple thousand bees from that original hive and they're never gonna miss it. But by golly, if you short out that split by a thousand bees, they're gonna miss it. Once again, what I do when I do late season splits, I don't even pay attention to whether I'm moving the queen or not. But every time I do it, I take my nuke box and I mark I put a, a number of the back of the nuke box, I number the back of the hive with a corresponding number, and seven days later I'll open up the nuke box if I don't find any emergency cells, I go to the donor hive, and I go in there and that's where I'll find them. So I, I don't need, I don't care where the queen went. And oftentimes <clears throat> I will take 10 frames, I, my, my hives are, like I said, typically double deep, I'll take 10 frames from the donor hive, 
and I'll make a double deep nuke. And you double, deep, double, deep. double deep nukes. Okay. You might say, well, why in the world would any fool use a double deep nuke when he can use a 10 frame hive? And if you remember the picture I had in the beginning where, you know, all of the stuff was, you, you might have noticed those stands are full. So I have an issue with real estate. And so I'm going up, just like they do in New York City, you know, I'm going up instead of, you know, it's just like that. The second thing is, and, and this is something that I've just got stuck in my head, and there may not be a, a, an ounce of good sense to it, but anytime I've overwintered bees in 10 frame deep boxes, single 10 frame Langstroths, by the end of the winter, I had a bunch of bees just jammed up against the top because they store their honey instinctively above the brood, and in the winter, that cluster instinctively moves up in the hive in search of honey. If I don't have any honey above them, if we get one of those spells like we do on occasion, where we get two or three weeks where that, that, that cluster of bees can't break, they may never find that honey. Whereas if it's right above them, they'll instinctively move to it. So again, I just got this stuck in my brain. I've never read it anywhere. No one with good sense ever told me, so it may not make a nickel's worth of sense, but I'm convinced. So I, I, do, I do my splits, oftentimes in double deep, sometimes in triple deeps, and oftentimes when I'm doing those splits, I'll take the donor hive and I'll put it into a double deep nuke. <clears throat> okay, that's how I do it. That's why I do it. I buy queens. I get them in those JZBZ cages. I don't know if people still get them like that or if people still get the old wooden cages or not. I don't know what, but it just seems like when I order a bunch of queens, that's what I get at the JZBC. I like them. I like them a lot. They come on a, they come on this strip and as long as they're in that strip, the bees in the hive can't get um, to the candy and I make a queenless queen bank. I make sure I take the queen out and that's where I store them while I'm using them and they get fed and looked after and the last one goes to be the queen for that bank. And that's just the way I do it. It's not anything magical. Um, <clears throat> when I use the JZBZs, I put, I put them on a frame of cat brood. I press the cage into the brood. I put it down and I sandwich it between a couple of frames. Um, this is seven days later. Yeah, I don't know if you can tell, but there's a whole row of queen cells here. I'm cutting out, getting ready to put a queen in. And you notice, I guess I should have pointed out, you notice double deep nukes all over the place. Some of them triple deeps. So I may even have a four deeper around. I'm embarrassed to admit that, but I might. Dumping extra bees in. And when I move that nuke to wherever it's going to go, there are a pile of bees in it, a pile of bees on it. It's not going to be a dink. It's not going to start out life as a dink. It might turn into one, but it's not going to start out as a dink. Marking queens, I'm marking queens. I'm pulling honey as hard as I can right now. As soon as I'm finished, I'm going to go back and I'm going to start treating for mites and I'm going to start going through trying to see what these hives need to get through the winter. And I'll always keep an eye, I don't, I don't make it my life's work, but I always look for queens. And I always have a pen with me and some kind of marking tube with me and I try to mark every queen I can find. And by the end of the season I have hopes that at least half of my hives have marked queens in them. And the reason is, is come spring, when I'm doing those splits and I'm looking for the queens to move them, I want them marked. And when I mark them, I'll take that pen, I'll mark the queen, and I'll put a mark on the back of the hive with that same pen. So I can go around in the spring and I walk along and I say, that one should have a mark queen, that one, and that. And those are the ones I go to first for my splits, for my springtime splits. My hive end, my, my nuke buck entrances tend to have hardware cloth on them because I use them to move bees. And what I do is I take, <clears throat> when I'm not moving bees and I'm using them for splits, I just peel a corner back. You can see where that one's been peeled back at one time or another and re-stapled. And I just do that because it makes it easier the next time I go to move it, but it also acts as a robbing screen. And I have not had a robbing event in, I can't tell you when, except for hives that just fully collapse. I have not had a nuke get in distress 
Oh, I'm just going to shut up before I put my foot in my mouth. Um, <clears throat> but you see double deeps, double deeps, double deeps. That one's getting ready to move. I've taken the feeder off and I'll just take a staple gun at dark o'clock one morning and staple it, throw it in the back of the truck and take it wherever it's going. <clears throat> I use two kinds of feeders, high top feeders. These are some older wooden style. They leak a bit, but they're okay. And these plastic ones, I really like them a lot. Everybody else hates them. I like them and I'll tell you why people hate them. Because they say, well, you put that on, you can't put a box over it. Box won't fit over it. Don't want it if I can't put a box over it. Well, I'm gonna tell you what. I do this and this. I put my top on. And what they're worried about is the next big storm that blows through blowing that feeder off. Well, a storm will blow through and it'll blow this top off. If that feeder's been on more, more than a day or two, it isn't coming off. Not without a hive tool. So I can't tell you how many storms I've gone out after found the top scattered to the wind, literally, and the feeders are still intact. And it takes probably about two or three inches of rain before you come over the top, before you've overfilled it. And then the rain, the water just runs down the back and the front of the hive. So it, it's really not a problem. I like these a lot. <clears throat> they make them for 10 frame hives. Don't do it. They're, they're bad news. Those are bad news. They, these white plastic pieces on the big ones are really, 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 they're vented and they're um, very, very uh, easy. They're easily damaged <clears throat> and they flex a lot. When you start taking them off, they flex and it fractures that plastic and then the bees get up in there and drown. So 10 frame, I don't like them, but the five frame I do and I think that's it. Is that quick enough? Did I, did I make sense? I, first, did I make, did this make sense? Well, you mentioned you were going to tell us about that hot weather and it worked. You thought it was going to be bad. I did. You know, see, what, I, what, what happens, I, I, I got the box then full. It, it's May. I got the box full of all, these, of, of all these nurse bees that I want to be nurse bees. I don't want to be, I don't want to be forgers. I want to be nurse bees until we start getting a lot of brood coming out, you know, merging. Well, I mean, it's 100 degrees, and I'm making the splits. And, um, and I'm thinking what's going to happen is they're going to immediately, a pile of those nurse bees are going to have to become foragers. They're going to have to go get water. They're going to, have, they're going to be going for water hard. And there won't be enough nurse bees left to manage the brood. And so my gut feeling was I was going to lose a boatload of brood. And I, I, I had a couple hives I opened up and I looked and I didn't see very many bees inside, but there were plenty coming and going. Um, but I went back a week later and they looked all right. They were, the brood was emerging, so they, they were keeping up with it. But that was my fear was that they, you know, have to make, for want of a better word, a decision between keeping the hive cool and, you know, tending to the brood. And I figured the brood would be left to sacrifice, they'd have to. So, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen. And once again, that's, you know, because I just said no to the dinks. You know, I, I, I know that's a silly thing to say, but it, it. The other thing I didn't say about late season splits, it, it may be in the notes that I handed out on late season splits, um, comb, keeping your comb, preserving comb. I will every year shake out 10 hives. I just, I'll go in, I'll look, I make sure they don't have a, a brood disease. They don't have symptoms of brood disease, but they're just limping along. They got a pile of drawn comb. Those bees are out in the yard. I'm shaking them right there. I'm taking that comb. I don't want to lose that comb. And these splits that I'm making late season splits, I'll put that comb on those guys and I'll feed them. So that's, that's another thing. Another advantage of a late season split is to preserve your comb. <clears throat>